sport to do conferences with people affiliated with the military everything always ticks along so perfectly smoothly so first i just want to reiterate the thanks to james for organizing um this entire program it's been absolutely stimulating so far and i've really enjoyed all of the presentations so thank you all for your time this afternoon uh, i'm dr hillary Briffo. i'm a lecturer in national security studies in the department of war studies here at king's and i was uh, previously in the department of defense studies so uh over where dr jordan is right now so it's very much we consider these kinds of projects a full school uh, initiative. So I have the absolute pleasure of chairing the panel on new research and perspectives on the Falklands War. Uh, Dr. James has already said that I revealed the title of our school conference in June about Back to the Future. And I think there is a little bit of that in this panel as well, because even though we're celebrating 40 years on uh, from the conflict, we're still thinking about new directions to take research on on this subject and we've already heard uh, from quite a few speakers about their experience of being there and uh, thinking about this topic but now we're also going to look ahead um, at what people are working on right now or hoping to work on in the future. So I've got a very rich panel, we've got quite a few presenters so what we're going to do is we'll hear from each of them for about 10 minutes. I'll try to be uh, as stringent as possible with the time so that hopefully we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions afterwards. Um, I think everybody is on the call, so that's absolutely brilliant. And so I won't take up much more time because I know there's a lot to get through on this panel. Uh, and so I'll, I'll move straight to introducing our first speaker. So we're going to be hearing first from Captain Christopher Skinner from the Royal Australian Navy, and he's going to be thinking about lessons for 1982 for Australia. And I think if I'm not mistaken, he's also calling in from Australia. So uh, thank you so much for being up with us live as well. I think that's a real treat uh, for us over here in Europe. So can you hear us? Uh, yes. Yes. yes, I'm just organizing my slides. And, Absolutely. Uh, I have two uh, main slides to show, so I should stick within your time limit quite happily. Brilliant. So, let's see. Um, okay, so this is actually the second slide. The first one is just the titles. Um, but anyway, this is what I really want to talk about. It's still loading um, for us just so that if you just give it just a moment, because oh, I don't okay. know if people can see it yet. So now it's loaded the PowerPoint. It's just not in presentation mode yet. If you wanted to put it in presentation mode, but we can see it and we can see the numbers. So if you also want to just progress like this, that works too. So uh, can you see it now? We can see them. We can see the map. Yes. Over to you. OK, um, can you hear me? OK. I'm check good. OK, um, look, the, the uh, primary lesson for uh, Australia um, is to take note of the very um, important comments that have been made uh, this afternoon um, and uh, the, the several uh, authoritative books and, uh, and papers that have been published. Um, but to put it in the context that I'm showing on this map, and none of the uh, islands for which Australia has an interest are at 8,000 miles away. But uh, for Australia, they represent a similar sort of challenge uh, in some respects. Um, and I've just labeled the ones here that um, uh, sort of set the boundary on, on that. Um, and I'd note the fact that Christmas Island has a population somewhat similar to the Falklands. Uh, Heard Island is the furthest away, 
Um, it, it's unpopulated, but it's Australian territory and exclusive economic zone. It's a, basically a volcanic. Uh, Macquarie Island is halfway to Antarctica, uh, where we operate three Antarctic bases, uh, which is already, uh, they're outnumbered by Chinese um, Antarctic bases uh, in much the same territorial areas. Um, but what uh, Australia has, does not have, of course, is the long history of maritime uh, power uh, exercise and, and political uh, influence. And so we, we've, we've got a struggle to, to, to sort of adapt. And, and that's where I... Um, these main points here, which I'll run through fairly quickly. Uh, some of them have already been covered by other speakers, so I won't dwell on them. Uh, but in particular, the, uh, the, the role of the exocets, and there weren't very many of them in the Falklands War, um, should have been, and is only just now starting to be a wake up call to the role of missiles in general. And uh, I, I, I don't think I need to dwell on that point um, with uh, drones and uh, uncrewed vehicles of all kinds. Uh, this is becoming more and more an important topic. And uh, frankly, um, in Australia, we're only just waking up to this and, and starting to think about the implications. Um, the second point of ships taken up from trade uh, we don't have a lot of ships to take up. So that's a major challenge. And I was interested to hear one of the earlier speakers talking about charters and um, uh, using um, uh, merchant ships that were on uh, uh, ordinary um, trade um, uh, missions. So we, we need to do a lot more work on that. Uh, logistics has been covered at great length, and, and I just think it's uh, quite extraordinary how the logistics for the Falklands War were, uh, were handled uh, over such a long distance and with very little uh, uh, preparation and uh, also um, not a great deal of um, facilities uh, en route. Um, the, the usage of missiles... Uh, and other weapons, and particularly decoys, um, is a big issue. And in Australia, we have woken up to that, and we've just initiated a, uh, a major effort to uh, build a domestic uh, production and uh, to some extent to reinvent some of the earlier work that was done in Australia on missile design and uh, development. Um, I'll leave the bottom one on that side for the moment. Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, very well discussed earlier. Uh, now we've got satellites and all sorts of other surveillance. So uh, uh, it's a whole new ball game, as they say. Um, Anti-submarine warfare has been well discussed. I won't dwell on that. Um, the, the role of the submarines operated by the Royal Navy were, were very significant. And the recent uh, uh, agreement of the UK and the US to the AUKUS agreement to support Australia acquiring various technologies, but most importantly, nuclear submarine technology is, is really important and uh, uh, gets us caught up to some extent. Um, the, uh, the bottom bullet on that side of making it more difficult for the other side. I think uh, need, more needs to be said about that. Um, how um, the Argentine understanding of what the UK was doing uh, was manipulated and or um, uh, influenced. I think there's a real story in that that, that uh, I'd be interested to hear more on another occasion. Um, the information warfare, somebody already made the point that um, in the modern day and age, everything would be um, hauled through the uh, 
social media and formal media and all sorts of disinformation going on as we're seeing with uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Um, but the, the, uh, the fourth bullet on the right um, is the one that I think uh, we've got the greatest lesson for us is to be ready to respond to situations that however unlikely they may appear at the time, uh, you've got to be uh, prepared as best possible for those to occur. So that, that's the end of my uh, 10 minutes. Thank you so much. And thank you for keeping to the, straight to the time. It sets us off very well for the rest of the session. Um, so, and there were a lot of practical tips in there that I think people will want to pick up on in the discussion. So thank you so much, uh, especially at such a late hour over there or early hour how you think about it. Okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker who I can already see is um, preparing slides, which is excellent. Um, so I can see uh, the screen share taking place. So we'll go to Group Captain John Alexander from the Royal Air Force, who's going to talk about the Falklands War and UK future operational doctrine. So would you like to do a sound check just before beginning? Can you hear me, Hilary? I can hear you now, yes. So we can hear you. Uh, the screen, it says you've started screen sharing, but sometimes it takes a minute, I think, with so many people on the call to load. So I'll let you know as soon as we can see it. Okay, well, I'll start anyway, and uh, I'll catch up with my slides later. So um, my uh, 10 minutes is a, a 21st century perspective on the Falklands campaign as operational art. I'll explain what I mean by operational art in a moment. Um, and I'm doing this uh, partly as a, as a researcher. So I published on air land integration uh, as a part-time uh, reserve with the Royal Air Force, uh, recently writing joint operational doctrine um, at Shrivenham uh, and now uh, observing joint exercises and also, I'm almost a veteran. So the, the uh, rapier squadron I was uh, serving on deployed to the Falklands after the Argentine surrender in August uh, 1982. So my screen has frozen. Can I just check that people can hear me? Can you hear me, Hillary? We can hear you. Your slides haven't come up, I'll but just... we can hear you. Loud and clear. Thank you. Um, so what I mean by operational art, um, to paraphrase uh, the Soviet military theorist Svetchin. My computer's doing something, just bear with me. There we go. Um, we can see the slides now. Okay, good. There we go. Um, operational art, I'm sure General Thompson would call this common sense. It's the planning and conduct of military operations to achieve strategic objectives by directing the effort of tactical forces. Uh, so it's generalship or admiralship or air marshalship. And it's also associated with the idea of the operational level, which is the level at which operational art is conducted. So at which campaigns and major operations are planned. Um, so applying it to the Falklands, I mean, we've already heard today uh, examples of how the Falklands campaign might be seen as an anachronism. There's no urban, there's no uh, people, all those things that Professor uh, Friedman said earlier, the law of armed conflict was complied with. Obviously the technology uh, is quite different now as well. Uh, but one of the things it, from a doctrine point of view is the Falklands campaign predated uh, the British, the belated British discovery of doctrine at the operational level uh, and the idea, again, in doctrine of, of joitry. Uh, that's not to say that those things didn't exist beforehand, they just weren't written down in the same way that they are uh, now and have been since the late uh, 80s. Um, Hugh Strawn in his uh, chapter on operational art in Britain um, up until 2009 doesn't actually mention the Falcons, which I, quite, I think is quite interesting. And if you look at current UK doctrine, the only mention uh, is for the moral component, that the Falklands is a fantastic example of uh, the moral component 
of fighting power for the British forces. There's also uh, an argument that operational art itself is an anachronism. We've touched on this a bit today. Um, the operational level now, the Joint Task Force headquarters are likely to be either US or NATO led. It's difficult to conceive of operations that would be uh, British led. There's an argument that the operational level artificially separates um, the tactical from the strategic. There's an argument that things like multi-domain integration, the idea of a gray zone, which is below the threshold of warfare, and ideas like information advantage, countless other buzzwords, mean that operational art is outdated because many of these things need to be um, coordinated, integrated, at the political, military, strategic level. And the idea of a purely military sphere of operation um, is no longer apt. But if we look at the Falklands, and I make two very broad points in the few minutes I've got left. One is, I think we can see the Falklands as a great, as a very successful campaign. Uh, and one of the reasons is because um, it was joined up from the strategic to the tactical. And arguably that started with um, Admiral Leach famously crashing a cabinet meeting uh, and convincing the prime minister that um, the Falklands campaign was very much in her in interest. It was an existential threat to her government and arguably Britain's place in the world. Um, and in response to that, she took advice and formed uh, a war cabinet. Uh, uh, John Major did that for the first Gulf campaign, but it's not been done since, notably in uh, Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. Um, and arguably what that meant was that the strategic to operational to the tactical was very joined up. And we've, we've covered some of these points already today. Uh, David Jordan mentioned the, the Vulcan raids and how they were instigated by the chiefs. Um, General Thompson has written about um, Goose Green and the government forcing the tempo of the land campaign. So without going into the detail, um, keeping this simple, um, I think we can see the Falklands uh, as a great example of the vertical integration of operational art from the strategic to the operational through the tactical. Um, what's mi missing, uh, if we look at the uh, command structure, and this is from um, Professor Friedman's official history, but what's missing and what um, students at Staff College struggle with now is there's no, um, there's no in theatre joint operational commander. Uh, many people think that Admiral Woodward is uh, the task force commander, of course he's not, it's Admiral Fieldhouse in Northwood. Admiral Fieldhouse keeps control because he thinks uh, he's best placed with comms um, and whatever to exercise. Uh, and, and therefore he has a number of uh, task groups and task units working for him. We've already heard today about the difficulty of coordinating, um, with Bluff Cove being an example of that. Um, I would argue as well uh, that the use of the RAF Harrier GR3 force uh, with, with, with 2020 hindsight is another example of of how the lack of a joint task force commander, which we now have in our uh, operational doctrine, um, how, how um, that lack uh, was felt. Um, and so just reinforcing David Jordan's point on the, on the Harrier GR3, um, the air defense, the fleet air defense was well set up um, based on the Sea Harriers. The GR3s were sent as Sea Harrier reinforcements. There was no idea when they left that they would be used for offensive air support. They ended up being used for offensive air support because um, the casualties to the Sea Harriers are much less than expected. But there was no, um, well, there's a very limited uh, command structure for the use of offensive air support. And I think 
uh, looking at the archives, looking at the uh, historical branches, narrative uh, for RAF operations, during Operation Corporate, which, which has been published online, um, you can see those lessons being learned. And I think that applies, therefore there are lessons there that are applying to today for what are called multi-domain operations. And as Admiral Parry has already explained, that's basically joint plus space and cyber. But in any uh, contemporary operation, then we need to think about where um, command uh, for those multi-domain multi operations is best placed. And in our doctrine, that's the joint task force headquarters between the four-star, three-star joint commander and between the tactical forces. Um, so that's it, that's my uh, 10 minutes on um, perspectives of the Falklands campaign from a 21st century British joint doctrine perspective. Brilliant. Thank you very much and another well-timed presentation and a big question to the group there on whether or not operational art is an anachronism or not that we can pick up on. Certainly you've presented a case um, of the importance of joining up our approach. So we'll move swiftly forward to our, our next presenter. Um, I, I can see on the program, we've got Dr. Louise Clare from the University of Manchester. And her, the title of her talk is War Does Not Begin With Its Outbreak, It Begins With the Use of Words. And so she's going to talk to us about media and cultural influences in the prelude to the 1982 Falklands Malvinas War. I also just wanted to flag and promote for her that she's got a book coming out very, very soon in July with Routledge. Uh, it's called Politics, Propaganda and the Press, International Reactions to the Falklands Malvinas Conflict. So you're going to get a taster of the research now, and then you can all head straight over to pre-order the book afterwards. So thank you so much for joining us um, for your presentation, Dr. Claire, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Hilary, for the introduction. Um, if I just able to share my screen with everyone, uh, hopefully it'll work reasonably smoothly. Can you see it? You can see it. It's not yet in presentation mode, but we can see the okay. slides. Yeah, just wanted to make sure. Yes, okay. we can hear you very well. So all good okay. to go. So over to you. Okay, yeah, good stuff. Um, I just want to say also thanks to James as well for inviting me to talk um, and thanks for organising the conference and this event. Um, so without further ado, I'll begin. Um, I'm going to begin with a quotation. Um, it's primarily based, this particular talk, on the United States focus and Hague shutter diplomacy, as you may have already guessed. Um, I have found the perfect symbol for this country the putrid toilet on the ground floor. Though reluctant to help us, the security creeps lead us around a pretty palm shaded interior courtyard, off the edges of which there is a corner. Some corner, it's unindated with peepee, -pee, huge puddles of it thoroughly soaking the pile of shredded newspaper, a facade of elegance and sophistication on the outside, behind which the calaco reality lies in all its stinky poo squalor. Um, if I can just get back to the next screen. Um, these are the words written in the diary of senior National Security Council staff member James Rentschler soon after the US delegation had arrived in Buenos Aires hoping to mediate a peaceful solution to the Falcon slash Malvinas crisis. Like other members of his party, Rentschler was somewhat shocked about the conditions with, with which he and his colleagues were presented with. What was more surprising, though, is the fact that the Argentine military junta expected to curry support from the United States for the Argentine recuperation of what they called as the Malvinas Islands that had taken place several days beforehand. Additionally, this early on in the crisis, adding hope to Argentina's cause was the fact that public support from the United States for Margaret Thatcher's UK government was by no means a given. Argentina, despite lukewarm relations during Carter years, was beginning to enjoy a closer rapport with Reagan's America. Key support was being provided for the Reagan doctrine in Latin America, and Argentines considered themselves an increasingly important piece of the Cold War jigsaw in US foreign policy in the region. As a result, the government hoped, even expected, the US to have sympathy for the nation's long-held La Causa Malvinas and to help them secure sovereignty over the islands. US decisions mattered, therefore, as the crisis unfolded and the diplomatic impressions were set to make a big difference to the course and eventual outcome of the war. 
Yet James Rentschler and his State Department colleagues, once they arrived as part of the team that was to conduct what famously became known as Alexander Haig shuttle diplomacy, were met with squalid conditions and likely to impress. Cultural faux pas or diplomatic mind games, this paper argues more for the former than for the latter. For in Rentschler's description lay a metaphorical show of desperation at the perceived injustices times rather than a calculated claim the sovereign territory the country had been due for a century or more. I argue therefore that during the initial phase of the Falklands crisis from the 2nd of April to the 30th of April 1982, cultural perceptions comprising of language, cultural norms such as values and beliefs and a nation's history at diplomatic level as well as those imbued in the media coverage of the unfolding crisis were instrumental in not only marginalizing the Argentine cause, but bolstered US support for and consolidated help towards the British campaign to retake the islands. Now, this is not to say that US global Cold War commitments as well as real politique uh, are factors to be ignored in the United States support of Britain, but cultural perceptions played a vitally important and until now largely neglected role in influencing US decision makers and in projecting the form and content of media output in the United States. So while many of us are familiar with the British side of the war in Argentina, the recovery of what they used to call as the Malvinas was firmly etched onto national consciousness. La Causa Malvinas, however, was a cause which was never really fully understood by British or US commentators. And this blind spot to an issue rooted within Argentine life and history aided in part the cultural collisions which occurred between the United States and Argentina especially during the crucial initial phase. And this served to bolster the British cause. So when the president of Argentina, General Leopoldo Gautieri, spoke to President Reagan on the eve of the invasion, the cultural connotations that his language imbued, not only the words, but also their usage and their tone, created an impression, James Rentschler summed up once more, that his, so Galtieri's, mafioso type English made him sound like a thug. Indeed, as a result of such diplomatic maneuvers, the depiction of the military junta as a gang of thugs was a lasting impression on key members of the US delegation that passed over into the portraits forged in the US media as the shuttle diplomacy stalled and wall grew closer. This lasting impression only served to marginalize the Argentine cause, moving the US closer and closer to a natural ally. So for Argentina, the invasion or the recuperation as they refer to it, um, was itself a culturally imbued action. And the cause was such a grand national moment that the crowd in the Plaza de Mayo, which greeted Galtieri, so Buenos Aires' main square on the 3rd of April, was reportedly 10,000 in number according to La Prensa, um, an Argentine newspaper, which had previously been um, critical of the Argentine junta in the past. In the British press, however, Argentina was branded as the aggressor and John Silken MP, seen here, described Galtieri as a bargain basement Mussolini. And the Times compared the, the Islander situation to that of the Poles in 1939. In a notion sparking British and US shared history, the US press referred to Argentine aggression and reminded the public of Argentina's delay in joining the Allies against Nazi Germany in World War II. So despite prior warnings of Argentine aggression, US Secretary of State Haig was sent on a mediating effort to London and Buenos Aires, and he's seen here with the Argentine foreign minister in the center and Galtieri um, on the left. Rentschler's account, which I started this paper with, was one of just many cultural misjudgments. And this attitude could be seen even before Haig shuttle diplomacy when Ronald Reagan had telephoned Galtieri. Galtieri kept Reagan waiting, as Rentschler described it once more, with all the evasive bullshit from palace flunkies. This unintended culturally inspired Argentine government action, which antagonized the US administration, was further perpetuated from the moment of Haig's arrival. Believing Haig would be impressed, he was taken on a helicopter ride over the Plaza de Mayo, which was filled with chanting crowds shouting, Argentina, Argentina. But to add to the importance of evoking memories of a nation's history is how Haig, merely 
Mott remarked later that the scenes reminded him of newsreels taken in Rome and Berlin in the 1930s. This instance served to reinforce the earlier imagery the US press had been creating about Nazi Argentina, since Haig had actually lived through World War II and post-war he'd served as Supreme Allied Commander for all NATO forces in Europe. It was evident, therefore, for Haig what an impression such Argentine action would create, being as he was a cultural product of his era. And Argentine action only served to distance them from the US and ally the US closer together with Britain. By stark contrast, Thatcher met the US delegation and led them to portraits very similar to these of Wellington and Nelson uh, to sort of reinforce the imagery that Britain's, of Britain's history of fighting dictatorships and aggressive powers in order to secure freedom and democracy. Over dinner, she referred to Neville Chamberlain to invoke again a sense of Anglo-American shared history, expressing the view that we in Britain simply refuse to reward aggression, and that's the lesson we learned from 1938. For the US delegation, Thatcher's reference enabled, to enabled them sorry, to identify more closely with the British cause, a view which was subsequently pressed for by the New York Times and perhaps strongly influenced by the cultural connotations of 1938. The newspaper advised that if the British Navy lacks the strength, negotiation can only occur after a clearer American tilt towards London. Not only was the New York Times response being influenced through the nation's history, but its support for a US tilt towards Britain was clearly being made evident to the Reagan administration at a crucial stage during Hague's shuttle diplomacy, and it provided a clear media support for the British cause. For, our, for the Argentines, the Malvinas cause was such that there was limited room for compromise without Argentine sovereignty over the islands being agreed. For them, the Malvinas were part of Argentine national identity, but for Britain, tolerating what she saw as armed aggression would not be acceptable, and Britain had a duty to her citizens, and the islanders were her citizens. So what's significant here, then, is the sharp contrast of which the British and the Argentines dealt with the US delegation. So in a final example, and to conclude, the Argentine negotiations of nine-hour straight sessions with Haig deeply angered him and prompted him to write, progress was made by syllables and centimetres and then vetoed by men who'd never even been part of the negotiations. Such was Haig's disillusionment and irritation with the Argentines that the British head of chancery, Robin Renrick, commented, it was disconcerting to find ourselves dealing with a US Secretary of State who under the strain had developed facial tics reminiscent of Dr. Strangelove. Sharp contrast it may seem then to straight talking Thatcher and good diplomacy some may say, but the fact that Britain knew how to handle the US delegation and portray Britain in a good light in US eyes is surely evidence of the British and US shared culture and knowing what will impress them, whilst at the same time, evidence of not just poor diplomacy on the Argentine behalf, but a cultural clash, not understanding how their actions would be misunderstood um, in a macho rhetoric style by the United States which marginalizes Argentina and ultimately leads to the United States to declare official support for Britain on the 30th of April, 1982. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. And we also have a speaker coming up soon on the US perspective. So we'll be able to see uh, some of what you've talked about as well. So uh, we'll move swiftly forwards. And thank you all so far for really keeping to time. Um, next up, we have Dr. Adrian per Pierce, who is Associate Professor of Spanish and Latin American History at University College London. He's going to be talking about a new history of the Falklands War. And I think this is research for your current book project if I understand correctly as well. That's right. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you and I can see your slides. So we're Great, good okay. to go over to you. Right. Well, thanks very much. Um, so I teach in the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at UCL and I'm writing a new history of the Falklands War that aims to draw more widely on the Spanish and Spanish literature from Argentina as well as on British sources. At the moment, though, I'm still working my way through the vast literature on the war in, in, in English. And this paper is about British personal diaries and memoirs as a source for the history of the war. So personal diaries and memoirs uh, began to be published even before the end of 1982, and they've continued to appear ever since. 
it's hard to say how many books of this kind have been published in total, but it certainly runs into the dozens uh, on the military side alone. And these are now appearing more frequently than ever before. So across 2021 and 2022, at least 20 new books on the Falklands will be published in the UK, and most of them are memoirs and diaries. So as a result, there are memoirs representing all of the services and most of the units involved. Some are by senior commanders, including probably the three most important memoirs by Sandy Woodward, Michael Clapp and Julian Thompson. Ship-based naval memoirs are also numerous. There's more than a dozen accounts written from the perspective of ships. There are also about a dozen memoirs written by Royal Marines, about half that by Paras. Five Brigade is represented somewhat more thinly, but with books from the perspective of the Gurkhas, as well as the Welsh Guards and the Scots Guards. One recent boom has been in memoirs of special forces and especially the SAS. So these three examples have all appeared in just the past 12 months, for example. I could go on, as I say, there are dozens of published memoirs and diaries in all. Now these books pose a number of theoretical challenges for historians. They're quite diverse internally. Some are diaries published more or less as they were written 40 years ago. Most are memoirs that might be based on diaries kept at the time or might have been written largely from memory or in consultation with other sources. A particular problem is that of verification and validation. So most of what's said in these books can be readily verified from other sources, but uh, some of what they say is essentially unverif unverifiable if we base ourselves on the books alone. Uh, nevertheless, taken together, these books clearly constitute a large and important corpus of primary materials for the history of the war. They can tell us a great deal about all sorts of things, from the centrally important to the relatively trivial. Since there's limited time here, I'm going to focus on the operational history of the war and the evidence these sources present for what, how the campaign developed. And I'll give just two examples. My first example is that the bombing of the Welsh Guards and others at Fitzroy on the 8th of June and the complex train of events that led to it over the period from the 2nd of June when Brigadier Tony Wilson made his impromptu move forwards with two para to Fitzroy and Bluff Cove from Goose Green. Of course, the personal accounts published by leading commanders are key here. The most important are those by Michael Clapp and Ewan Southby Taylor alongside that of Sandy Woodward. These accounts tell us in great detail not only how the operation to reinforce Wilson and two para actually developed over the key few days, but also about the specific train of events that led to two landing ships logistics lying during daylight hours at Fitzroy, essentially unprotected, with most of their troops still embarked up to the moment of the Argentine air attacks. No history of those events can be written without reference to these key memoirs then. But other accounts add a great deal more detail and texture to the story. Tom Martin's memoir of service with Corona Battery, the Royal Artillery, on how close they came to shelling the Scots Guards on their arrival at Bluff Cove on the 6th of June from just 100 yards away in what could have been an awful blue on blue incident. Nick Vaux's account of watching the gas from Mount Challenger as the two LSLs sat at Fitzroy only five kilometers away in what he describes as looking like a NATO exercise scenario rather than an urgent wartime one. Tony McNally's book about his experience with a rapier air defense battery on how he was in the operator's seat uh, of his unit when it failed at the crucial moment and so allowed the Argentine attack to go ahead unhindered. David Morgan's relation of how he flew a combat air patrol for, in a sea harrier from Hermes and shot down two of the A4s involved in the attacks of the 8th of June within seconds of each other. Or even Rick Jolly's medical memoir, memoir on his treatment of the grievously wounded. In other words, personal memoirs and diaries not only provide the essential outline to an episode such as this, but much of the detail and the context and the atmosphere as well. So my second example is based on Cedric Delvey's account of his leadership of D Squadron SAS Across an Angry Sea that was published in 2018. I found Delvey's book quite revealing, above all because he's almost entirely open as to the nature of the SAS's involvement in some of the more controversial operations of the war. The SAS played central roles in both the first and among the very last actions of the war in South Georgia on the 21st of April and against Courtley Ridge outside Stanley on the 13th of June. And I'll discuss both of those briefly. Both these operations have been subject to criticism on different levels. And Delvis is actually very frank about the role of the SAS in them. 
To begin with South Georgia and Operation Paraket, the contribution of the SAS was originally intended to consist of a single troop, the D Squadron's Mountain Troop. But firstly, Delvis tells us how he persuaded the two key men involved, Brian Young, the captain of HMS Antrim and the overall commander of the South Georgia Group, and Guy Sheridan, the commander of the land forces, to embark all four troops of D Squadron. He did so by giving them to, to understand that he had, and I quote, some authority, even instruction to do so, despite the fact that he himself acknowledges that this wasn't true. At this point, Delvis didn't have authority to embark the whole of D Squadron, although this seems to have been approved after the fact. From the 13th of April then, the whole of D Squadron became involved in Operation Paraket. Delvis calls this shaping our own destiny. And it had significant repercussions. It caused some confusion, notably around the command arrangements, and not least because Delvis was a major like Sheridan. And certainly from this point, Sheridan, ostensibly commander of land forces, seems to have been largely sidelined. The SAS itself took a leading role in the planning of the operation. And this led to perhaps their most controversial involvement with the development of a plan for the recapture of South Georgia that was based on preliminary reconnaissance from the Fortuna Glacier. The use of the Fortuna Glacier as an approach to the Argentine positions was opposed by all the men present with relevant expertise on the grounds that it was simply too dangerous. These included Guy Sheridan himself, an expert mountaineer, Nick Barker, the captain of HMS Endurance, the only Royal Naval vessel stationed in the area in 1982, the British Antarctic Survey scientist stationed on South Georgia, and the air crew of HMS Antrim, who would later rescue the SAS from the glacier on the morning of the 22nd of April in hazardous conditions. All these expressed reservations about the Fortuna plan, and it did indeed turn out to be flawed to the extent that the SAS had to be retrieved from the glacier, having spent a night there in miserable conditions and at the cost of two helicopters. So to read Delvis's own account of the lead up to these events and from the perspective of the SAS is quite revealing. And this is also true of among the last actions of the war, the SAS and SBS attack on Courtley Ridge, just north of Stanley on the 13th of June. This raid was intended to be a diversionary attack to cover among the last of the key battles, two powers assault on Wireless Ridge to the west. It too has provoked criticism on the grounds that it was uncalled for and proved a distraction. It actually gets a mixed write-up in most accounts though, with some arguing that it did draw fire away from two para and contribute to the Argentine collapse. Delvis's raid, uh, account of this raid across a whole chapter of his book is certainly among the most important yet to appear. And again, this is arguably because he's so frank as to the deficiencies in the planning, uh, if not the execution of the operation. He writes that ultimately, he and his men were faced with mounting this raid at short notice, and I quote, from a cold start without supporting intelligence to conduct attack against an, an attack against an unknown target behind a water obstacle to be crossed using unfamiliar motorboats driven by people we'd never worked with before. The team inserted onto the shore of Courtley Ridge was immediately pinned down by heavy fire and was forced to withdraw across the water to the north on the way they were lit up uh, by a spotlight mounted on an Argentine hospital ship and began to take further fire. And Delvis tells us that he was asked by an SAS man from G Squadron for permission to take out the spotlight with a Milan missile, which raised the prospect of a British missile attack on an Argentine hospital ship in the last hours of the war. Delvis declined permission for this, but again, his memoir will be a key source for this episode, as for so many others that the SAS were involved with. So to conclude then, British personal diaries and memoirs constitute a rich source for the history of the Falklands War. Some, including those by the leading commanders have long been recognized as key sources. Others offer new insights into particular aspects of the campaign. Most don't necessarily bring new revelations, but the cumulative effect of them is to add rich layers to the history of the war as it's already established. And I'll just end by noting that the accessibility and the impact of the personal narratives presented in these books, together with the sheer number of them and their availability through cheap, good editions, means they may have a greater impact on public understandings of the war than any other sources, including academic histories.
Thank you so much for that, Dr. Pierce. So uh, not only uh, a few for our reading lists of these presentations, but I think you mentioned more than 20 coming out soon. So I think we've got enough reading for the next 40 years when we look back on 80 years of the conflict. And so we'll move now, Nick, to our next presentation. Um, and our next speaker is going to be uh, Kip Diogenio, who's Chief of Staff of the Air Force, US Air Force, and PhD scholar at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, which is actually a partner of King's College London, a partner university. So we're very glad uh, to see the collaboration coming out in the topics we're looking at as well. And he's going to talk to us about the impact of the Falklands War on US strategy. Because of course, as David Jordan said earlier, none of this was happening in a vacuum and we also need to think about um, how this impacts strategies of allies and other players as well. So uh, Kip, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me, Dr. Griffith? Yes, I can hear you and we can see you. So comms check all good. Perfect. Th thanks so much for the kind introduction. Uh, as an active duty captain, I have to say that the views that follow are my own and don't reflect those of the Department of Defense. But with that out of the way, uh, it's a really great privilege for me as a War Studies alum uh, to be part of such a wonderful event and among distinguished scholars and academics, leaders, and veterans. Um, and as we reflect on the 40 years that have passed since the Falklands War, it's just remarkable to observe, and we've seen from this panel too, the diversity of scholarship on really what, what is one of the 20th century's most compelling conflicts. Uh, this has been referenced earlier, but I think too often some scholars will depict the conflicts as in the words of Max Hastings recently in the foreword to the Delves' memoir actually, is, he labels the Falklands a freak of history, an anachronism such as the world will never see again. Yet in the year 2022, projecting power thousands of miles away from a homeland to prevent an unlawful invasion of a sovereign island seems all the more relevant. And while many commentators then and since have characterized the war of something more akin to the Second World War than maybe a conflict of the 21st century, with the perspective of history, we now know that instances of combat in the South Atlantic did offer us glimpses into future trends in the character of warfare. And perhaps no moment underscores the global reach of the Falklands War more than the one that took place exactly 40 years ago tomorrow, when Augusto Betacarats and Armando Mayora took off from the airfield at uh, Naval Air Station Rio Grande. And those at this event uh, know well the details of the sinking of the HMS Sheffield, and I'll not bore you with recounting them here. But what I'll do instead is illustrate and illuminate the reverberations of that moment. The exit missile attack shocked not only the British task force we know, uh, but it also sent tremors to naval powers around the world. And indeed in the United States, the attack took on a particular salience for just as the Sheffield was slipping beneath the waves, US Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman was before Congress defending his uh, request for two nuclear powered aircraft carriers. And even in an era in the United States of defense largesse in the Reagan administration, Lehman's request for two nuclear aircraft carriers and one bill drew ire from both sides of the political aisle. Lehman had joined the chorus of US Navy admirals who believed the Soviet Union had eroded the Navy's advantage at sea, and he sought to restore what he termed command of the seas to the US Navy. And to do so, Lehman wanted to construct a 600 ship Navy with 15, 15 nuclear powered carriers at its backbone. Successive US Chief of Naval Operations had advocated for such an investment, but now with Lehman as SECNAV, the Navy had the political capital to sell its pitch to Congress. But if there were questions about Lehman's maritime strategy before the Sheffield attack, Critics in the United States seized on the Falklands War as evidence of the program's bleak and possibly ruinous future. Journalists raised alarms about the implications of the attack for the US Navy in prominent publications across the country. Newsweek ran a feature with the foreboding headline, Are Big Warships Doomed? In a similar spirit, the New York Times warned about the US Navy's unsinkable carrier admirals and their insistence on nuclear supercarriers. The Falklands War, the Times editorialized, offered a fiery lesson about the vulnerability of surface ships to attack by computer-guided missiles. And likewise, the Wall Street Journal proclaimed that precision-guided munitions were the great equalizers in military conflict. And so seemingly overnight in the United States, the Sheffield had become synonymous with naval vulnerability, and we heard that alluded to earlier uh, in this panel. And the idea went that if the Argentine Navy could acquire sophisticated weaponry, employ it with little training, and cripple a component of the Royal Navy's task force, what would that pretend for the US Navy's in an engagement with the Soviet Union? So before the Argentine forces surrendered on June 14th, 1982, a debate over the lessons of the Falklands War raged in the American press and on Capitol Hill. The lessons, observers argued, cast out on Lehman's program. The Falklands War then had for the moment thrust Lehman's vision of a 600 ship Navy onto the American consciousness. 
And more troubling perhaps for the Navy was the reality that the Falklands War publicly revealed the institution's fissures between two competing visions about the US Navy's raison d'etre from future conflict. The lens through which the US Navy viewed the Falklands War was rooted in the service's efforts to reimagine its contributions to grand strategy. But to understand that lens, it's necessary for us to first grasp the competing visions within the US Navy and how they interacted with national, national strategy, as well as how they drastically shifted from the Jimmy Carter administration to the Reagan administration, all within a Cold War context. And so we'll rewind quick three years ago, or three years prior to the Falklands War in 1979, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations in the US, Admiral Thomas Hayward, was testifying before Congress on the question of why do we need a Navy? Hayward painted a grim picture of the Navy's future, and he warned the House that soon the Navy would lose its margin of superiority to the Soviets. And more alarming was Hayward's assessment of the type of war the Navy had to be prepared to confront. Any conflict between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, Hayward told members, would inevitably be global in scope, but at its current strength, the Navy couldn't fight that type of conflict. In order to carry out that type of conflict, Hayward asked for new aircraft carriers. Hayward's testimony in 1979 marked a very public split with Jimmy Carter and his administration. The Carter administration designated the Navy's mission then as guaranteeing military and economic resupply and sea control of the Atlantic Ocean and nothing about global power projection. And while Carter did believe in the efficacy of carriers, he raised questions personally about the number, size, and type the US Navy needed. And the president himself supplied that answer. In 1978, Carter had vetoed defense legislation explicitly because it included, included funding for a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. That bill, Carter argued, would weaken our defenses and would erode our contributions to NATO to pay for a carrier we don't need. While the cost of a nuclear powered aircraft carrier loomed large in Carter's thinking, his veto was also reflective of the administration's national security strategy. And here, Carter articulated a vision of naval thought that valued a large number of small ships at a reduced cost. And not all naval officers in the US disagreed. In fact, then Vice Admiral Stansfield Turner, later Carter's director of the Central Intelligence Agency, had long expressed doubts about the survivability of aircraft carriers in conventional war. Carriers, Turner argued, will certainly be the honey to which the bear is attracted. And the emergence of sophisticated Soviet anti-surface weaponry made aircraft carriers vulnerable. Moreover, the carriers' costs, Turner argued, did not justify their investment on mass. But cost wasn't a hurdle for Carter's successor, and atop the Reagan administration's priorities was a pledge to reinvigorate American grand strategy as Reagan saw it. Under the Carter administration, the United States sought to maintain an overall balance in military power. Reagan instead vowed to reverse the expansion of Soviet control and military presence, and an integral component of that philosophy for Reagan was the United States Navy. For Reagan, maritime superiority was a necessity. He identified the Navy as the force most suitable for maintaining U.S. presence in threatened areas around the world, and whereas the Carter administration viewed the Navy's contributions in defensive terms, Reagan believed in the Navy's offensive potential and in global terms. Central Europe no doubt remained significant, but Reagan emphasized the need for the US to conduct offensive operations on the Soviet periphery. And to regain maritime superiority, Reagan vowed to restore the US fleet to 600 ships. That line sounds familiar, of course, and it originated with the Reagan campaign's upstart naval advisor, who would also become the administration's nominee for Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman. So the lessons of the Falklands War, and most prominently the sinking of the HMS Sheffield, collided with a Navy that was 16 months into redefining its global mission. Through the development of a maritime strategy based on global power projection, Lehman sought to achieve President Reagan's vision. However, the intellectual underpinnings and the, and the price tag of Lehman's vision did generate widespread scrutiny. For example, Senator Gary Hart, a Lehman critic, exemplified congressional skepticism following the attack on the Sheffield. Senator Hart believed that the Exocet missile had ushered in a new era of naval warfare, and he asked rhetorically, how effective will our naval Navy be if we keep on buying very few ships because each is so expensive? And at the same time, modern missiles and torpedoes are making every ship more vulnerable. Hart warned that the Sheffield illustrated a Navy dependent on just 15 carriers looks rather fragile when the Soviet Union can launch not just one missile, but dozens at each carrier. Stansfield Turner agreed. Turner argued that one lesson of the Sheffield is that Navy should distribute their power and value over as many ships as possible, rather than concentrating them in just a few. The Falklands War, Turner proclaimed, ushered in the day of the missile, in which technological trends indicated that missiles and not aircraft will soon dominate our battlefields. Lehman, however, valued this public debate and saw the Falk in the Falklands War not an episode of despair, but recognized it as an opportunity for the Navy. Following the 1973 Yom Kippur War between Israel and Egypt, 
the U.S. Army had assembled a team of experts to identify potential lessons from that conflict to inform the Army's modernization efforts. The Falklands War, Lehman surmised, might serve similar ends for the Navy. He gathered a group of expert officers, civilians, and defense consultants, therefore, to mine the Falklands for lessons. The U.S. Navy shortly thereafter released an unclassified study entitled Lessons of the Falklands War in advance of Lehman's appear next appearance before Congress. The study evaluated the Royal Navy's maritime performance and surmised how the U.S. Navy might have fared if it faced the same scenario. The study's author authors left zero doubt about what lessons the Falklands War off offered. The U.S. Navy, they said, has been structured to project power anywhere on the globe, and most of what happened in the South Atlantic supports the judgments that underlay all that is being done in this administration's naval recovery program. The study attempted to settle the public debate, particularly over carriers. The study's authors concluded that virtually none of the aircraft which hit the British ships from mainland bases in Argentina could have done so had there been a modern, full-size carrier air wing in the opposing force. Moreover, if an Argentine fighter had leaked through the U.S. Navy's defense system, it is doubtful if any of the attacks sustained by British ships would have penetrated a vital space or done significant damage to a modern U.S. aircraft carrier. In short, for the Navy, the Falklands War confirmed that small carriers were both more vulnerable and less effective than their nuclear-powered counterparts, and this study was a complete endorsement of Lehman's naval vision, as one might expect. So ultimately, Lehman succeeded in using the lessons of the Falklands War to defend the U.S. Navy's modernization efforts, and despite acrimonious debate over the war's lessons, the Navy concluded that the conflict validating its pre-existing conceptions about maritime power. So more broadly with the Falklands War, we can see that it illuminates how the U.S. military learns and applies lessons from foreign conflicts. On less inflammatory issue, issues, such as the importance of naval presence or the role of merchant marine logistics, the U.S. Navy did implement lessons learned from the Falklands across the force. But debates from the Falklands War that touched politically sensitive issues, such as aircraft carrier size, failed to produce consensus. And paradoxically, Officers and analysts on both sides of the debate used the same events from the Falklands War to buttress their diametrically opposed positions. So in short, the Falklands War revealed the battle for the soul of the U.S. Navy, and that John Lehman succeeded in using the conflict to drive the Navy shipbuilding program, did make significant contributions to U.S. grand strategy, and also to the backbone of the naval force structure that the United States depends on to this day. But that force structure is one, ironically, that has become increasingly vulnerable to many variants of the nascent threats that Augusto Betacarats and Armando Mayora demonstrated to the Royal Navy and American observers 40 years ago in the South Atlantic. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, another really well-timed talk uh, ended on a bit of a, a troubling note, leaving us vulnerable to, to vulnerabilities identified 40 years ago. Perhaps we can we can think about how to mitigate some of that from the lessons that you you spoke about and you raised. And so we move on to our penultimate presenter for this session, um, Professor David Manley, um, who should be with us. Yes, Hello. I can see him. So he's Professor of Naval Architecture at University College London, and he's going to talk to us about the Falklands War impact on naval architecture. Okay, I'm just going to try and can you can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you. So sound check works. Okay, let's see if I can get the screen share to work. Yes, so I can see it. It's just not in presentation mode yet. Yeah. Okay, how's, how's that? <clears throat> Perfect. So over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Um, right, so um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, lessons of modern ship design from the uh, from the Falklands conflict. Um, we talked about lessons identified. Um, hopefully, I'll um, be able to show that actually some of the lessons, that, or many of the lessons that were identified, we did actually act on, we have acted on. Um, and I should say at the moment, so from the outset, that this is a, a, an extract of a presentation that I gave to the Royal Corps of Naval Constructors uh, 30th anniversary conference, um, updated slightly with, with, with some, some sort of information that we've received or that I've generated since then. Uh, and if anybody uh, would like a copy of the full version of this presentation, I can send that later. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, um, well, I'll, I'll just get straight into it because obviously I'm time limited. So, um, the in the aftermath of the, uh, uh, the the Falklands conflict, in the aftermath of Op Corporate, um, <clears throat> the Sea Systems Controller and others um, instigated uh, a, a thorough review. The outcome of which was a document called the Corporate Action Grid. Um, and it says that it's a comprehensive post-war review conducted 1982 to 1983, um, which 
covered a wide area, wide, wide range of uh, areas of ship design and operation. Um, and, and, and was very frank in its, um, in its review. It, it was, you know, if it, it, nothing was, was sugar-coated, I've, I've seen some of the original um, papers from that, and, and, and it was quite damning in, in a number of areas, and, and quite rightly so. The purpose of generating this document um, was to, as I say, identify those lessons, but also to act on them. Uh, and it, it led to the development of a roadmap for change in existing ships uh, and, uh, and, and the derivation of lessons learned in the design of new ships. Um, that could be seen immediately in the design of the Type 23. So the Type 23 frigate went, went through a, a radical design change uh, as a result of, of uh, lessons in the Falklands. Um, but more uh, uh, widespread change um, was, was fed into, into later designs as well. And um, in a a, a very a very charitable move by, by by the UK. Those lessons were were, were shared very widely uh, with our, our NATO allies, um, and, and and the um, um, the, the quality of, of, of NATO warship design uh, in, in in survivability in particular and damage control and firefighting um, was significantly improved as a result. The corporate action grid um, covered well all all of these subjects here. Um, th these are the the, um, the the topics that were discussed in in, in the ship design aspect. There's a, there's a whole load of extra um, sections that covered ship operability, but uh, I, I'm just listing the the actual ship design issues here. So obviously I'm not going to go through all of those, um, but just to focus in on um, the headline lessons really. Um, some of these relate obviously relate to um, the loss of Sheffield, uh, where the prevention of of blast spread. Um, would have um, given the ship a significant, significantly improved uh, chance of surviving, as it was uh, blast spreading through the ship, uh, you know, damaged watertight doors and prevented smoke boundaries from being formed, and, and, and that was the primary cause of the loss of the vessel. Uh, resilient firefighting systems, um, it, it was noted that firefighting systems in damaged areas of the ship themselves became damaged uh, and, and were unable to um, you know, uh, co contribute to recoverability efforts and also the provision of those firefighting systems in terms of things like the numbers of firefighting pumps uh, and their operability was um, you know, significantly underestimated in, in earlier designs and, and has been increased um, significantly since that point. Um, other subjects, um, aluminium is a, uh, a, a commonly um, a, a common myth from the Falklands uh, conflict that you know, um, Royal Navy ships were lost because of burning aluminium superstructures. Um, there is actually no evidence that uh, any ship was lost as a result of um, aluminium superstructure or aluminium failure. Where aluminium was an issue was in the use of its use in, uh, in ladders and deck platings in, in internal compartments to save weight. Um, and those ladders and deck plates would melt or become very brittle under fire conditions, so that if uh, crew were trying to escape up them after they've been affected by fire, the thing would just collapse. Um, but a whole range of um, you know very significant issues for, for ship designers. Uh, just to, to look in on the on the Sheffield uh, as as just one example, um, the diagram at the top shows the, um, uh, the 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 extent of compartments initially affected by by blast damage from the detonation of the Exocet warhead. Um, it's quite extensive, as you can see. There's um, six main uh, watertight um, sections of the ship were affected, and fire spread, uh, fire and smoke spread beyond uh, that, those compartments. You know, sometime after the initial hit. The uh, diagram below that shows the extent of damage which we would have expected to have seen if the ship had been designed using the kind of design techniques and mitigation measures which have been developed since Operation Corpora. Uh, and and that case is eminently survivable. So key lessons um, go, going forward. Uh, Op Corporate reminded us uh, and continues to remind us that the Royal Navy needs warships. Uh, there are frequent forays into um, you know, studies looking at the adoption of civilian standards you know, to, to reduce the cost of warships. You know, the, the, it is possible to, to use those in some cases. Uh, in most cases, they should be adopted with caution or not at all. Uh, CONOPS, concepts of operations and scenarios used in, in modeling. Um, our recommendation, believe those at your peril. Um, 
no Royal Navy ship, as far as I'm aware, has ever been used solely for the purposes which it's designed. Uh, mission creep, um, operation creep, we always use ships for, for different purposes to those that they're, they're intended for. Um, so designing very tightly within, within requirements give, you know, gives us issues in the future. Reliance on technology is an issue. Uh, we've seen it only recently um, with, the, with the loss of the Moskva, another survivable situation. Um, but before that, uh, the attack on the Stark, the attack on the Israeli ship Hannett on, on the coal, all ships with very significant self-defense systems, um, all of which failed. Um, and the use of risk-based design. Um, risk-based design is fine as long as you're aware of the risks that you're taking. Uh, in many cases, our designers and others are probably not aware of those risks, or maybe they are, but they're not, they're not prepared to acknowledge them. We like to use this argument as a reason to go away from design standards, uh, military standards in particular, uh, whilst we forget that those standards, standards were written that way for a reason, and often with a very steep learning curve. So I would argue that the need for modern warships to go in harm's way and to fight hurt must be paramount in the warship designer's mind. You know, after all, that, that's why we design warships. They are warships for a reason. Failure to do that may mean far more than just the loss of the, of the vessel. You know, losing a key ship uh, in a task group could mean the end of a mission. In the post-corporate environment, great strides were made in addressing these issues. And, um, uh, and many of those uh, were in, uh, invoked through improving design standards in things like um, uh, materials used on ship, uh, structures, uh, blast resistance, firefighting systems, for example. Um, financial pressures since then, you know, have repeatedly tried to push away uh, at some of those lessons learned and, and, and our designers continuously have to rebuff those issues, you know, to, to keep us with that winning edge. So I'd argue that designers today it's essential for them to acquaint themselves with these lessons and others from operational experience and other theatre of operations to ensure that those lessons are not, not forgotten. In today's environment of increased safety management, which is indeed very, very sensible, um, but is now being extended to uh, include, extend the definition of safety to include wartime risks, designers have a duty of care. You know, the um, Supreme Court has ruled that the Ministry of Defence has a duty of care to its personnel in combat. Uh, so designers have a duty of care to address foreseeable incidents. Uh, and one could argue that having learnt those lessons from 1982, those could hardly be considered as any, anything other than foreseeable. Uh, and just to conclude, rather uh, a, a quote or maybe a, a frequent misquote, um, but something which uh, as a, uh, a, a Royal Navy uh, ship designer and advisor to, to warship projects and also um, an educator for the uh, current generation of um, uh, the UK's Royal Navy uh, uh, ship designers, you know, uh, these are lessons which we must remember, we must learn from. If we don't, we are doomed to repeat them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so uh, we'll come now to uh, the final presentation for the session, but then we will have some time for questions afterwards. So we've got last and certainly not least uh, with us, um, Major from the US Army, Antonio Salinas, and he's affiliated with the National Intelligence University and Kicks College London. And he's going to be talking about lethality in war from 1982 to the Ukraine crisis. And so I can already see your slides. So that's brilliant. And let's do a sound check. Um, Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. And I, I, keep it on, I keep it on this view, that way I can manipulate certain icons. So it's a uh, unique way of presenting. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you're here in the States or good evening if you're in Australia. Uh, so my name is Antonio Salinas. And first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to be here. I feel honored to be here amongst the legends who participate in this war and who's been writing about this for decades. And it's, uh, it's truly an honor. So again, my name is Antonio Salinas and I'll be presenting uh, excerpts from my paper, A Mortal Reminder, Reexamining Lethality from 1982 uh, Falcons War to the Ukraine crisis. And because I'm still on active duty, uh, everything I say, whether it's ignorant or brilliant, uh, I hope for the latter, uh, it's me, right? This is not uh, the official policy of 
of the United States. Uh, these are my own opinions, my own academic uh, undertakings. So my perspective is a little different. I am uh, not a sailor. I've been in the military for about 24 years. Uh, I was misguided as a young man and I joined the Marines. Uh, following grad school, I did some time in the infantry with service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I taught military and European history at West Point. And I'm currently over in the Pentagon and I'm pursuing my PhD uh, via distance at King's College London. And I also teach at National in uh, Intelligence University. So I am utterly fascinated, like most of you hear about the Falcons War, right? It has it all. It has it all uh, from air to air engagements, right? Infantry, bayonet charges, uh, special forces, uh, which everyone loves. And with respect to this presentation, anti-ship cruise missiles. And this will be the crux of what I talk about for the next uh, nine minutes or so. So what's in it for you today? Uh, we'll talk about lessons learned. And, you know, lessons learned is always awkward when you talk in academic circles, but we'll try to mine something out of this. And then we're gonna look to the future by looking at the past to see what certain theory is presented. And then we'll look at anti-ship cruise missiles and the character of war, right? The nature of warfare does not change, but as Klaus was tells us, its character certainly evolves. Uh, why do we study military history? I always give this point whenever I teach and it's, it's different, right? Whether you're a student, uh, whether you're forced to take it, whether you're a scholar, uh, whether you're a policymaker uh, or <clears throat> a service member, yeah, why do we do it? So what I always ask people with this is, who's had surgery in the room? Inevitably, someone will raise their hand and I'll ask them a question that's kind of awkward. Um, and I'll ask them, did you have dinner with that doctor who cut you open? And they'll say, no, what do you mean? I'm like, so we let complete strangers uh, give us a knockout drug <clears throat> and cut us open. Why do we do that? You know, is it trust and so on? And I'll eventually get to, the first time they cut you open, was that their first time cutting open, cutting open a human, right? You, you hope not. Uh, so this is what I use for military history. I think military history is our cadaver, right? Where we can dissect it, we can cut it open, and we can ask the questions. You know, why did General Blue go right when he clearly should have went left? Uh, why did they attack when they should have held? And with respect to the Falcons, I think it is absolutely vital, especially in the contemporary multi-domain battlefield that we dissected. Whether you're a historian, whether you're a strategist, whether you're a member of the armed forces, and I think these lessons uh, are mortal lessons. So hopefully uh, you're you're thrilled and captivated by the intro. Uh, we'll talk about anti-ship cruise missiles. We'll look at theorists, and then we'll dabble into some countermeasures. Right? Is just a harbinger of doom? or just an evolution into uh, this profession of warfare. <clears throat> so here's kind of the crux of my paper here. I really believe this should have been the conflict that foreshadowed the evolving uh, character of warfare. In particular, anti-ship missiles need to be studies. And these lessons echo to us in names like Sheffield, Conveyor, and Glenn Morgan. And even a few weeks ago, with the, with the Russian loss of Moscow in the Black Sea, are these now lessons learned to lessons confirmed? So the crux of this paper and the study is, do we recognize the impact of anti-ship cruise missiles on the character of warfare? This is, paper is a greater part of my thesis, <clears throat> where I, my PhD thesis, which I'm working on currently, where I think this could have been the military disaster that foreshadowed the dangers of anti-access and air denial to the United States and the allies, but I think it's been overlooked as an anomaly, but to our adversaries, particularly the Chinese, uh, they might look at this as a blueprint of how to destroy the Western Gulf War blitzkrieg. And the Falcons War is important, right? This is the first anti-access air denial uh, war, which pits a joint expeditionary force against somebody at home, right? Somebody with a home field advantage uh, has supreme advantage in firepower, which we've seen in the Falklands, and we're seeing even now in Ukraine. And this begs the, the bigger question is, what will war in the future look like? Right? Military historians and especially intelligence officers, we make poor profits. But through my study, maybe our next war, or at least parts of our next war, was foreshadowed or fought 40 years ago. A big point <clears throat> as overall military historian, was this the Asian Corps that we missed? <clears throat> Not to give you a lecture on medieval warfare, but in, four, in 1415, an outnumbered English force uh, beat a numer numerically superior French force composed mostly of mounted and dismounted knights through muscle-fueled firepower through arrows. 
And Calvary charges did not go away after that, but their character changed for centuries on after that. So were the Falklands as devastating as a lesson as Agincourt was? So going over the lessons here, it's easy when I'm here in my basement office, air conditioning to talk about these human, these human losses. But for those of us who are combat veterans who've seen gunfire or smelt death, right? These echo different lessons to us. So I make no light, uh, easy light of these lessons here. So the loss of the Sheffield, later of the conveyor in the battle in San Carlos, uh, also fell to Exocet anti-ship cruise missiles, and then Glenn Morgan by a land-based one. And the Chinese, they're very, very interested in this. They state when Argentina fired the Exocet and sank that advanced to warship, that this changed the method of naval warfare. So they particularly pay attention to this. And I'm wondering if we have, or if we should do it more. Also, what if Argentina had more than five Exocets? Would this, would this have changed the outcome? And then just recently, within a few weeks ago, are these lessons learned? Now lessons confirmed with a Russian ship. So my little uh, Harbinger of Doom preview for this is perhaps the burning hulks of the Sheffield, the Conveyor, and the Glen Morgan, and now the Moskva, and the brigades of Russian vehicles on the roads of Kiev are but a, pre are but a preview, preview trailer. These horrifying images might only be a preview for the horrific bloodbaths that await the next conventional context, con excuse me, contest, uh, contest. Perhaps we should pay heed to these images as a new no man's land consisting not only of hundreds of yards, but rather thousands of kilometers. And the issue with this is anti-service cruise missiles are even more lethal now, right? No longer uh, 72 kilometers, but up to 400. And if you put them on an aircraft, they can go well over a thousand kilometers. That travel now a mark four. So the problem in this entire paper is that we're at a time where technology far outweighs the tactics or doctrine. And when this happens in the American Civil War uh, or in the Great War, the 20th century World War I, is <clears throat> the casualties are devastating, right? The first few years of World War, excuse me, a few months of World War I had devastating casualties. And then the death toll drops dramatically as trenches are introduced. So is this a new no man's land, right? As we approach it no longer at hundreds of meters as in the Great War in the 20th century, but thousands of kilometers. And are we prepared to make a way through here? And what will be the cost of our forces as we move, mass, move west in the Pacific or in other places? Briefly, we'll take a look at a few lines from theorists. Uh, Clausewitz, especially if you study land warfare or any type of warfare, mostly we start with this. And he states that theory is indebted to the last war. But have we seriously begun to pay off this debt? Or is the Falcons War or the Moscow, will this be a payday loan, which will incur interest that we will not be prepared to pay, or when we do pay, will cost hundreds, if not thousands of lives. This quote here, right, he's recognizing this uh, where distance matters in the French Revolution, but these will continue to get more and more lethal and harder to detect as time goes on. The issue with technology is that they don't come with, instru they come with instruction manuals, not doctrine. And I think through dissecting the Falcons War uh, and even the, the recent lessons in the Black Sea, we should take a close look at our doctrine and ask ourselves, are we ready? Are anti-ship cruise missiles the great equalizer of war, right? As in David and Goliath, will having this weapon system give places, whether they're great power or not, the ability to compete in an international form or even against great powers? And then finally for Clausewitz, he mentions, the defensive form is stronger. Is this still true in the modern era? Uh, with respect to Ukraine, we're seeing essences of this, but we don't know yet. But we must dissect what lessons we have. With respect to Julian Corbett, he says here, right, theory is not the silver bullet, right? There are no silver bullets in history, but they'll help us make sure our plan covers all the ground. So hopefully we can make sure our theory and doctrine can reflect this modern day threat. He's, Corbin also talks about the command of the sea, right? We don't necessarily have to have fleets there, right? It's where the weapon systems can inflect their influence in the seas. So we need to, we need to study that because our adversaries are. And then finally with Mahan, 
He says, we have experimental knowledge and practically none as fleets adapt. The Falcons, this is all we have of a modern maritime conflict since the bad old midway. So we should continue to look at this and hopefully if our doctrine does not reflect it yet, we should ensure that. And also what is the weather gauge of 21st century that Mahan writes about? Is it this kill chain, right? The ability to identify, to track, to target, weaponize and finally kill. Whoever can do that faster and faster. And the Falcons has many examples of that. Finally, some solutions, uh, which are around in my paper and other academics, right? The, the idea of drone swarms to overwhelm or pickets, right? Less ships, uh, not just carriers or frigates, but maybe even Coast Guard cutters that have anti-ship cruise missiles themselves to counter the enemy. There was also, there's really a panel about operational art, right? We can't just go for phase lines. We might have to go step by step. And also a theorist from the East, right? All warfare, all warf, excuse me, warfare is based on deception. So as we enter the 21st century of the multi-domain environment, it is harder and more difficult to hide. But while we can be seen, we can also, while we can't trick the sensors as much, maybe we can deceive enemy commanders, right? By taking an indirect approach to make our true intent not known of where we're going. So do we teach in our doctrine or to our commanders? Uh, brief the longbows of the 21st century, right? Not just anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, but with javelins. And then most recently with attacks on drones of the Black Sea, uh, something to be looked at. So in all, take it back to biblical times, how did David beat Goliath, right? It wasn't as big, but using that muscle-fueled firepower. Uh, so this can be, for example, Ukraine against Russia. But what happens when Goliath chooses the sling over the spear? with respects to great powers like China. So in all, we do not yet have a battle-tested doctrine to face this threat. So it's vital for us to learn from these lessons and not violently charge into the teeth of the enemy. We should definitely not seek to remake the Psalm of the 21st century. So with that, I think I'm briefly over time. Uh, the big question I'll leave you with here is when you think about the past wars, when you think about the theorists, maybe we need new theories and new theorists. Maybe some of them are sitting here on this panel and ask ourselves, are we ready for the next war? Thank you. Thank you so much. So that brings us to the end of the presentations and we've still got a little bit of time before uh, the closing remarks. So we do have an opportunity to, to have some questions and get a bit of a discussion going. Um, it would be great if the panelists who've just spoken uh, could appear so that we, we can see each other in the discussion uh, if your bandwidth allows it. Um, so thank you all once again. I'm checking in the, in the Q&A box and there is a question uh, from Peter Hoare that I think was a bit was a bit specific, um, where he asked the Franks report says there was no intelligence warning of the Argentine invasion. When police did Commander Clapp and Major General Thompson first hear about the invasion, I don't know if anybody knows the specific response to that very specific question, but I wanted to flag it. Um, and if a panelist does know, give me a wave. Yes. Yeah, I, I got one for you. So uh, the, the British intelligence assessment a year out uh, gave warning that uh, Argent the Argentina junta might use force. Here, I, ha I have it right here. I can share with you. Uh, well, I can just talk it through here. Uh, the JIC assessment, so this is the British assessment here. If negotiate, if uh, stated this in April of 1981, if negotiations continued to fail, there'd be a high risk of it resorting to forcible measures against British interests. In such circumstances, military action or full-scale invasions of the Falklands could not be discounted. And when I teach this, I kind of talk about sometimes strategic misconceptions can outweigh the live intelligence, uh, simply believing that they're not willing to do it. So that's one instance uh, of, of a strategic warning. Thank you. And Peter said that he had a second question, but it hasn't come up. Is Peter on the call? Would you like to uh, submit your question maybe in the chat or let us know? Um, 
in the meantime, in the meantime, I'll pose a, a question to the panel. So we had, I mean, all your talks are absolutely fantastic. I did notice uh, towards the, the last two, perhaps we, we got, there was some, uh, not, I don't want to say negativity, but there are some troubling themes that emerged. You know, we talked about, Kip was talking about vulnerability and uh, Antonio was asking us, you know, are we really ready for the next war? Are we paying the debt of previous conflict? So maybe I'd ask from the, from studying uh, this new research and the directions you panelists are taking your studies in, does, do you think the lessons give you cause to be optimistic about us learning the lessons in the future direction of warfare? Or are you thinking there's much more to be done before we can uh, turn that uh, into a more uh, glass half full perspective. What are your thoughts as we reflect on the anniversary? Yes, David. Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, I think I touched on it in mine. Um, there's a, um, a, a an ever present need for, for for ship designers to to keep those lessons in people's minds. Um, I think I think we, we go through cycles. We, we we learn lessons, we write reports, we change standards, we improve things. Um, from the Royal Navy's perspective, you know, the the, um, the 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 pinnacle of this, I think, was was Type Forty Five. You know, there are there are features in Type Forty Five, you know, which have come directly out of the Falklands conflict. You know, which have made that the most survivable surface escort that we've built since the end of the Second World War. Um, and then, having reached that that pinnacle. The, you know, the, the, the lessons are 20, 30, now 40 years in the past. Uh, and, you know, people question whether they're relevant. Um, uh, and, and there's the, this, this inevitable, do we really need to do that? Do we really need to spend that money? Can we use that material that, yeah, maybe, maybe it burns, but hey, it's cheaper than, than this other stuff. Um, hey, and we're a cost cap project. So we're always having to fight that battle. Absolutely. And I think Kip spoke about cost as a hurdle as well in your presentation. But yes, you wanted to come in as well, Kip. Yeah, I think uh, just to add, um, I think a lot of studying this conflict too, and, and conflicts like it, just remind us that when when we're looking for this so-called lessons learned to be applied, a lot of it depends on the questions that we ask of the conflict itself. In, in the Navy's case, um, I don't think they're the officers who, and analysts who looked at it were being dishonest in the way they evaluated the conflict, but the question they asked was one that would reaffirm or validate the, the plan that they had with the 600 ship Navy for the United States and, and so on. Um, and it's always interesting. I think David Fitzgerald, a political scientist, he, he asked this question of counterinsurgency doctrine, but I think the, the idea of lessons learned applies is the, the lens of which we look back on conflict seems to change across our, our own lived experience I, mean, I think that phenomenon is interested in and it's one that as historians we have to always remind ourselves about. Um, uh, I yes, have Chris. Uh, two points that I feel are uh, in line with your um, challenge you just issued. Um, firstly, the whole nature of seaborne trade um, has not in any way diminished. Uh, it's always going to take up a very big part of maritime activity. And even, you know, when we talk about countries like China, which is a, you know, potential uh, uh, aggressor in the future, we have enormous maritime trade arrangements with them even so. And uh, I, I think we haven't thought through how do you balance those things uh, in a practical sense? That's point one. Um, the other one is one that was made by an earlier speaker, and that is the very low cost and the ubiquitous availability of uncrewed vehicles of all kinds, and uh, the fact that they can be easily uh, weaponized and used in swarms and other collaborative uh, ventures. And uh, I, I um, challenge my uh, younger colleagues, um, are you actually wargaming this? Are, are you going through the, uh, the modeling of, of dealing with that situation? And I haven't been reassured at all by the responses I've been uh, receiving. End of comment. Thank you very much. Yes, David. 
I'd, I'd just like to say, without going into any specific details, uh, the answer to that last question is yes, we are wargaming it. We've also got a wargaming network at King's. Maybe there should be some King's UCL unexpected teaming up on this. It could be the conflict that actually unites the university. F funnily enough, we are down at King's next Monday. <laughs> Brilliant. And so we're we're almost out of time, but I I thought I'd I'd give the floor to you if there's one more question or anything anybody else wants to raise. Yes, Adrian. I just had a question for Louise. Listen to the very interesting presentation. I mean, are, are you at heart saying that much of the U.S. attitude to the Falklands War and um, eventual kind of swing towards the U.K. supporting the U.K came out of cultural prejudice against Latin Americans in general and Argentines specifically? Um, thanks for your question. I think it plays a significant role in the way in which Hague is handled both in London and Buenos Aires. I recognise it's not the main um, overarching feature, but I do think it plays a significant role and it deserves more attention than it has been afforded, particularly if you think um, when Reagan was born, um, what he lived through and, and Weinberger, um, and obviously Haig himself as well, allying with Thatcher, they're all part of that sort of World War II or post-World War II and World War II generation. Um, and I think they it hadn't been lost on them what the, the uh, sacrifices that had been made in the Second World War. And you know, Argentina doesn't declare war on um, the Axis powers until March 1945, I think, and, you know, doesn't break off relations with the Axis powers until something like January 44. So I think um, sort of that sense uh, as well, particularly of um, very prominent Nazis, for, exa for example, uh, Mengele, who they didn't realise had died in 79. They believed he was still alive in Argentina in 1982. So the fact that they were sort of harboring Nazis was brought out in the US press as well, which I didn't put in to the talk, the sort of space and, and time, but the, the press did weigh quite heavily on the Reagan administration's decision, I think, as well, because if they hadn't supported the British uh, and ultimately, um, like officially, because I do realise they were supporting them sort of militarily uh, from around the 2nd, 3rd of April, but um, in terms of gaining uh, weaponry, et cetera, for particularly Weinberger. Um, but if they hadn't supported the British, there might have been sort of a threat and repercussions from the press turning against the Reagan administration. I hope that answers your question. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. So the very last question in the chat comes from Joshua Down, who's asked, thinking of perspectives that may be less explored, how has the role and function, status, etc., of the Falkland Islands Defence Force changed since 1982? Does anybody want to weigh in on this one? Perhaps one left for us to go away and think about. He's given us some homework for after the webinar. Um, so Joshua, we'll, we'll hang on to that and have a think. Well, Tom's come in and said much more professional. So at least that's a, that's a good sign. Um, and hopefully, you know, talks like this uh, and the sessions today will only add to that and to lessons learned as we've been talking about. So please let me get, take a moment to just thank you all so much for your presentations. David, John, Louise, Antonio, Kip, Adrian, Christopher, they were all absolutely brilliant. And it's so exciting to see the range of new research that's coming out um, on a, such a diverse panel, working on so many different topics spanning from the US to Australia. Um, we've kept, managed to keep Christopher awake even across the time zone. So I think it's testament to your presentations and your energy and so after this do go out and buy Adrian and Louise's books as they come out and just before that I'll pass to James to do the closing remarks and thank you again James for organizing this it's been absolutely brilliant down to all your hard work. Thank you Hilary it's, it's been a pleasure and I think it's fair to say some excellent papers and discussion here. Um, just uh, some thoughts and I, I gathered quite a few so a good sign of, of how good our presentations are today. It was fitting our, our final panelist is a King's PhD student who's starting out and he ended with a question are we ready for the next war and to think of Clausewitz and Sir Julian 
and Mahan, they spent entire careers looking at questions such as this. But in the British context, Sir Julian Corbett reminds us that for an island nation, maintaining the peace is our primary objective. And certainly the British way of doing that and the British way of war is by the presence of a sea power around the world. We set out uh, with this Falklands 40 event, offer up some new perspectives and research. And I, and I think it's fair to say we've covered a, a massive spectrum of discussion and this is a real healthy sign for the future. Uh, I've no doubt that research and witness statements will continue to be released, published and developed uh, from both sides of the conflict. We've, we've discussed an awful lot uh, I think in Western terms would probably be the, the way of putting it, Britain, America, Europe, uh, and Commonwealth as well. Um, but there is work being done by uh, uh, academics in South America, and there's the Brazil Institute in Kings, I know, which is, is covering this quite a bit. So, um, and that's very illuminating to see what, what is thought in, in South America and, and Argentina. Uh, so, there's no doubt that new research will be published. I know the focus will remain a popular thesis topic for bachelor students and uh, master students in war studies. The war continues to be a source of debate in education and have a role to play in military education. I know we have PhD researchers who will have the advantage of distance and time frame events to continue to expand our knowledge and the wider history of the Falkland Islands. We look very closely at 1982, but of course, the Falkland Islands have a, a far longer heritage that uh, range back to the age of sail, the period of exploration, industrial revolution, and particularly the First World War. We've just passed the centenary of the First World War. But I know I'm certainly looking forward to seeing uh, all of this research in the public domain. I am very grateful to the High Representative for his time today that we heard at the beginning uh, and our academics, of course, are thankful for the service of our veterans and current service personnel. Also, a big thank you to my colleagues, Dr. David Jordan, Dr. Griffith. It has been a pleasure to work with you and often overlooked our admin staff at King's who uh, really do help out by the scenes and they, and dare I say, they also tolerate us academics as well. So, but on that note, uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we will have a recording on the King's War Studies YouTube channel uh, in the future. We're going to include a few additional interviews and papers with that. So please give us a bit of time to get that online. Uh, and on that note, thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's been a fascinating afternoon. Hmm. Evening.